Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Insightful Thinkers podcast. Quite recently, I heard somebody listening to a conspiracy theory video about how wearing masks is some kind of a ploy by the government to uh, against its own citizens um, and how COVID is a hoax and all sorts of foolishness that you'll find online and typically through social media. In a BBC report, it was found that in the first week of the UK lockdown, 46% of internet using adults and 58% of 18 to 24 year olds in the UK saw false or misleading information about the virus. So it was around kind of this time that I realized the gravity of the problem of misinformation and now that um, misinformation hasn't just started, but now that it really can cost people their lives if they believe in a false story, the stakes are a little bit higher now. So this is why we're talking about this today. We're talking about why people believe in misinformation. Misinformation is incorrect or misleading information. Um, besides misinformation on COVID, Misinformation contaminates public discourse on the economy, foreign policy, gun control, climate change, vaccination, and genetically modified food, and all, all sorts of things like this. So it's, we really must understand what misinformation is so that we can potentially be inoculated against believing it. Once you understand a concept, you can make conclusions on how to use information to your benefit. So... This is why I think it's important to talk about this today. Let's have an in-depth analysis into why people believe in misinformation. The related reading for this episode will be, um, it's a book by Zimdars and McLeod that actually just released by the MIT Press. It's called Fake News, Understanding Media and Misinformation in the Digital Age. That's the main source that I used for this episode. So if you want to know more about this, check out that book. The first reason why people believe in misinformation revolves around something called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is an effect discovered by Leon Festinger in 1957. And what happens with cognitive dissonance is that we are all more likely to believe information that supports our pre-existing opinions and beliefs. Not only are we more likely to believe information that supports our pre-existing beliefs, but we also tend to seek out information that confirms our existing beliefs and we avoid information that conflicts with them. Well, why do we do this? So Leon Festinger's research in 1957, his theory that he developed on cognitive dissonance, it posited that exposure to information that challenges a person's perspective creates a discrepancy between his or her own views and the ones that are being presented. So when you see something that conflicts with your existing beliefs, there's a discrepancy there between your views and then this new information. This new information that contradicts with your existing beliefs uh, creates psychological discomfort. To avoid psychological discomfort, people seek out and are more receptive to information that confirms their beliefs. So we have like a bias to accept information that um, supports what we kind of fundamentally believe already. So if someone fundamentally already has suspicions about the government's role in these things, then as soon as they see information about it, they're going to be more likely to believe it. And they're also going to be more likely to seek out this type of false information or misinformation as well. Even when people have their false beliefs corrected, they also tend to reinterpret the information in a way that makes their initial beliefs seem justified too. So let's talk about this here. A 1956 Riken and Schachter experiment demonstrated this. So cult members were found to increase their devotion to their belief system after their doomsday date passed. So this cult had a day of who knows what it, what it was, maybe in the 1950s, right before this experiment was conducted. And they thought there was going to be a doomsday when the world would end. And the, the date passed. And instead of admitting that they were wrong, what they did is they decided to interpret the world's survival as evidence that their belief in their cult actually saved the world. So when it comes to news, uh, people are prone to believe information that resonates with their existing beliefs. 
And when something happens that doesn't resonate with their existing beliefs, they actually just reinterpret this information. They're very critical about this conflicting information and they try to just snap it into their existing worldview, just like this cult did when the doomsday passed and they realized we have to find an explanation for why the end of the world didn't come to pass. So you can see how this in this applies to misinformation on the web. Once you're down the rabbit hole of thinking that COVID is a hoax, you're going to be more receptive to information that confirms your false belief and you'll be less receptive to real science that disconfirms your false beliefs. And your opinion kind of gets stronger and stronger as you see, and you seek out more and more information that confirms your false beliefs. And the algorithm on YouTube or whatever platform you're on feeds you more and more similar content to this already false belief. So you can see how people can spiral out of control with starting with this kind of bias towards information that they believe in. That's reason number one. Reason number two for believing in misinformation is because people tend to use cognitive shortcuts to processing fake news. There's something called the cognitive miser approach. Um, oftentimes, people will not exert the effort to scrutinize news and information simply because doing so requires too much effort. People tend to treat cognitive energy as a valuable resource, often reserved for situations in which cognition or thought is deemed to be crucial. So people are cognitive misers for information. They don't necessarily exert all the effort needed to fact check an article that they immediately retweet. I can't remember the exact statistic, but somebody, um, and again, who knows, this could be misinformation, but no, this, uh, I can't remember exactly what podcast it was, but it was a, a reputable science podcast that said, um, oftentimes, uh, people don't even use, don't even actually open up the article that they retweet. They actually just look at the headline and then they just retweet it. And this is a great example of the cognitive miser approach, how it's not always the, f the truthfulness of an article. It's just other factors to determine whether an article is credible. Oftentimes readers may base their decision on heuristics or cues, kind of like a flashy title. Um, or even the attractiveness of the layout or the familiarity of the source, rather than devote effort to weighing the logic and the veracity of the article's content. So if nothing else, this is just a way to sort through all the information flows that we see in the information age. Check out that episode as well, just on how information is so accessible and we're actually saturated with information now in today's age that we kind of do have to be cognitive misers and it's difficult to fact check every single source that we are communicating with others. So with increasingly more information flows we see in this information age, th you, this is why you can really see that it's not always the best most factual content that we choose to consume. Oftentimes it's just the content that looks the best or the headline that stands out the most that determines what grabs people's attention. So, and often it's misinformation that grabs people's attention because it tugs at your emotions. Um, it's appealing because it is not in, oftentimes misinformation is not what you regularly hear in the mainstream media. So this is why it can really cause a pull on people and it sticks with people in their thoughts and beliefs. And uh, again, you can see how this traps people in misinformation spirals when um, they're not going by the factfulness of the article. They're just going by um, the attractiveness of the article and they click into that. And then all of a sudden they start seeing all these other related articles that also are untrue and follow the same line of faulty reasoning. One heuristic or a mental shortcut that people use to choose what content to consume and believe in is social endorsement. So this is what us cognitive misers use to, um, to choose what content to consume. So social endorsement is the extent to which we think other people are supporting and sharing the content. 
you see how many retweets, you see how many likes or whatever, or even within your communities, uh, you see that there's a lot relative to other posts. These bandwagon effects override people's initial concerns about dubious message sources. So just the fact that a lot of people are sharing it makes people more likely as cognitive misers, as people who constantly take shortcuts, it makes us more likely to share misinformation. Reason number three for believing in misinformation is just a general mistrust in the media that seems to have developed quite recently, although it has been a trend for a while. Research by Safi and Marchi finds that with younger audiences in particular, alternative satirical and non-mainstream sources, mostly all online, are seen as more credible than the legacy media sources like Fox, CNN, NBC, and ABC. Gallup polls have found that public trust in the media to report the news fully, accurately, and fairly has been declining for decades. Why? Why has this public trust in the media been declining for decades? Well, reason number one is that the people that society looks up to, like politicians, Politicians themselves have attacked the credibility of mainstream media sources for years. And it's not just Trump, but take the 2018 May tweet from Trump when he says, the fake news is working overtime. Just reported that despite the tremendous success we are having with the economy and all things else, 91% of the network news about me is all negative and fake. Why do we work so hard in working with the media when it is corrupt? So here Trump is almost conflating fake news with disinformation. It doesn't seem a lot of the things that he calls fake news is, is not, um, or yeah, he, he's conflating fake news with dis- disagreeable news. So a lot of the things he calls fake news is not actually fake. He just doesn't fully agree with what they're saying. And a lot of it might, um, go a little bit over the top and, and all the little details and, and to try to take them down. But either way, it's not always fake news that he calls fake news. But as politicians do this, then the public starts to distrust these legacy news sources a little more as well. It exacerbates public, public mistrust in journalism when our leaders do this. Another reason for this decline of the public's trust in media uh, is, is really because the line between news and entertainment has been blurring recently. A lot of news channels, like these legacy news channels like Fox, CNN, and MSNBC, they pass off emotionally charged partisan content as news content. And you see how biased each of these news sources are. So they really have themselves to blame as well for the public's mistrust in media because they're not providing unbiased information. So And people are starting to see through this and people are starting to not trust them as much. So this is another reason why people um, may, (laughs) well, in in a sense, this is, this is almost a reason not to believe in, in a lot of the misinformation out there. But the issue is that when they, when people mistrust the mass media and the legacy media who overall do a pretty good job of reporting the news, then they turn to their own websites and their own really internet cults and things like this that they feel is a better news source when in reality it's not nearly as high quality of journalism even as these these biased legacy news sources so this is the reason number three for believing in misinformation it's kind of indirect it's because people have a a general mistrust in in these bigger media sources, then they turn to kind of uh, less credible sources. Reason number four for believing in misinformation is <laughs> not why we should, but why people do believe in misinformation is just due simply to repetition of sources and of articles. And we've touched on this and how people will share something when it has a lot of like retweets or likes, and it's like a bandwagon effect but we'll go more into detail of this, how when something constantly gets repeated, you start to believe it. So this is called the illusory truth effect, a well-known effect in psychology. This is just the fact that the more people who see or hear a piece of information that isn't challenged, the more likely that information seems true. 
So if in if you're in your little echo chamber with people who all think the same way as you and I don't know what it may be that they use whether it's a forum or some kind of a website and the same information gets peddled over and over without people challenging it then you'll believe that it's true wholeheartedly simply repeating a statement in this case over and over makes it seem truer and you can see how this not only works with people in their own little echo chambers but also just in social media in general how it can exacerbate these issues when you see more shares, more reposts and retweets. Say you don't look at the comments and no one's challenging and you just see it's been shared a bunch of times on Facebook or whatever. You might say, oh my goodness, this must be, this must be real. Uh, COVID, it must have been created in a lab or, or whatever the case may be. You're just going to latch on to this idea that comes out. Prominent examples of misinformation that has been shared repeatedly other than things to do with COVID and COVID being a hoax or whatever is the Great Wall of China is visible from the moon, vaccinations cause autism, or 9-11 was an inside job and all these types of things that simply due to repetition, the statements become more believable all of a sudden. Let's get into more of how social media exacerbates some of the issues with people becoming susceptible to misinformation. The issue with social media is that both the individual's biased choices and the platform's tailored algorithms converge together on highly selective exposure to news and stories. So your own existing, remember, this is like combining the psych, our own psychology with what's happening in the algorithms that are fed to us. It's, it's our own biases, our own existing beliefs that we bring to the table, make us seek out information that we agree with even if it's misinformation, and then the algorithm to keep you on the platform, it pumps back in for information, even if it's misinformation a lot of the time, back at you that resembles content you've searched before, you've liked before, or you've watched before. So when you combine your own biases for information that you support, and then the algorithms that are fed to you, it can create like a Um, not even like a cycle, but you can go down the wrong path with misinformation. You can see how that can happen to people. Also, as I kind of touched on previously, users can find themselves in echo chambers and filter bubbles that amplify rather than test or modulate their initial beliefs. Just like we seek out information that agrees with our existing beliefs, we seek out people who agree with information that we agree with too. So then that gets you in these communities. And because it's these communities are more accessible now with social media, you can get stuck in these echo chambers. Within this echo chamber of like-minded people, group polarization can happen. So this is just when views within a group become more extreme rather than more moderate. Suspicion may escalate into obsession. Disagreements with another tribe can intensify into demonization disapproval may inflate to loathing. And this is a direct quote from social, the social psychology of gullibility by Forgas and Bomeister released last year. And you can really see how even notwithstanding misinformation, this happens as well, just with uh, sides on the political spectrum. And you can see the hate and then the, the disagreements uh, just between people on either side of the spectrum and how, what really may not be the biggest difference is it turns people into like tribes against one another. And social media seems to do this because you are constantly seeing tweets. Or we'll just talk about Twitter tweets from like-minded people or th- things posted from people who think like you. And then as soon as you see the dissenting opinion, people kind of rail away against each other because of this group polarization that occurs and people get, more and more closely connected with a community due to social media. And that has its benefits in some ways. And it's great when you get connected with a community of, for instance, basketball fans or, or something that you like as well. Um, Say it's a podcasting community or whatever, or, or, or an artist you like, and everyone likes that same artist where the implications aren't as major, but once it becomes kind of politically charged and things like this, then that's when the group polarization that occurs can create problems. 
we're going to close off today's episode with why people spread information and further exacerbating the issue of people believing in it. Because if no one was spreading misinformation, no one would be able to believe it in the first place. Well, there seems to be social gratifications that happen when you share misinformation. Sharing news with others allows people to socialize and feel a sense of status within their peer groups. Um, so what's happening is when you are kind of the first person to share this information, even if it is misinformation, you kind of actually gain almost like a status in a way. Um, because fake news, urban legends, and conspiracy theories and things like this are more novel than the run of the mill truth, users are driven to share them on a platform where social status is often determined by how quickly one posts new and relevant content. So oftentimes if you are the early bird, you'll get the worm of, of, uh, I guess you could say social status and, and you are the first one to share it and you just stumbled upon some knowledge. You are like the detective and you were the first one to share this. So some people are so quick to share these things, even if it's misinformation and they use like the catchy title or the flashy article uh, picture that goes along with it to just share it immediately and say, oh my goodness, this must be true. And you kind of gain a social status in the way. Scholars have also suggested that embracing conspiracy explanations helps people who are feeling disconnected to tap into fringe groups with like-minded people. The draw of many conspiracy theories could be the feeling of belonging to a special group of seemingly independent-minded others who are in the know as well. So, and this comes from the uh, primary source uh, from Zimdars and McLeod, Fake News, Understanding Media, and Misinformation in the Digital Age. So it's almost as if people who are disconnected from society, perhaps due to their existing beliefs, again, go, going back to the cognitive dissonance and back to their uh, existing beliefs about how they don't agree with, with a lot of real information out there and they don't agree with science. And then they find these groups to connect with and then they feel a little more connected, even though there's there are these fringe groups, they feel like, oh man, we're in the group who's in the know. We know everything that's happening science doesn't know or things like this. And this is where this anti-scientific sentiment comes from. It's from people partially kind of wanting to associate with the group. Um, and now with social media, there are plenty more of these groups to find that you can associate with that people share information within. And it, it comes out of those groups as well into the, the public too. That's the issue of misinformation. That is the um, that's why people believe in misinformation, really. I wanted to know the psychology of it a little bit. Um, perhaps I didn't quite find as much information as I liked for, um, like what, what is so attractive about being contrarian maybe. And, and, and maybe it has touched on that a little bit, what I've, from what I've learned, but it just seems like there, there might even be more to what makes people people seem to just feel so much joy in just being a contrarian and being someone who who disagrees with, with the rest of the group. And, and perhaps some of the explanation did come through the research and, and hence through this podcast about how people like, people who are on the outside in, they like to be associated with, with a fringe group, even though it is a fringe group, they now feel like they are like the, the small group of people who are in the know compared to everyone else in the world. So it, maybe it is, goes back to that social status thing about how when you are the contrarian and you are the one who's in the know, or you, so you think you feel more of a sense of social status. Like, you, you know, what's going on in the government, uh, you know, what's going on and it's all conspiracy and, and no one else knows, but I know. So it's, it's, perhaps a social status thing. Thank you for listening to this episode, everybody. Um, this is one of my favorite ones yet because, uh, yeah, it was more of a spur of the moment one when I kind of saw how people were, um, I saw people getting sucked into this misinformation and how much of a problem it can be, especially during COVID and how it can really cost people their lives if they get sucked into it. So hopefully this was applicable to the times you guys. Thank you. 
so much for listening all the way through. Just know we are growing our community through word of mouth. So if you liked this episode or if you enjoyed up the analysis, please share this episode with one or two people you know who are also interested uh, perhaps in this issue of misinformation as well. Please subscribe or follow on whatever platform you listen or watch on. Please also leave a star rating or review on Apple Podcasts or like on YouTube and share your own ideas too through the YouTube comments section or from the Connect page on the website, insightfulthinkersmedia.com, Instagram at insightfulthinkersmedia, or Twitter at TeamITM. You can also check out the articles and the poems that are on the website. And if you want to join our monthly ITP video conference call where we analyze topics together every month, you can support the podcast on Patreon, everybody. Whatever you guys do to support, listening and watching is always plenty as i always say and we'll be back next monday for more in-depth analysis into a diverse set of topics take care everybody